Yes. Off we go. Good morning, everybody, and welcome to another SACPA session. SACPA acknowledges that this event takes place on the lands of the Blackfoot people and Métis Nation of Alberta Region 3, and we pay respect to their past, present, and future cultural heritage, beliefs, and relationships to the land. SACPA is very thankful for the continuing support we receive from the University of Lethbridge, Shaw Spotlight, and the Lethbridge Herald. We're very happy to have with us today Sean Flucker. Um, thank you for joining us today. Um, the topic is Alberta allows for public participation in resource development, but what are the parameters and who are deemed stakeholders? Sean Flucker is an associate professor in the Faculty of Law at the University of Calgary. His research includes examining legal frameworks, governing public participation, and transparency in resources and environmental decision-making. He has written extensively on procedural and substantive rule, rules governing access to legal processes, judicial reviews, and, accessing, and access to information. His article, The Right to Public Participation in Resources and Environmental Decision-Making in Alberta, provides a critical assessment of these issues, specifically in relationship to the AER and its predecessors. And he writes frequently on current developments in public participation at the Faculty of Law's blog. Thank you so much to, for joining us today, Sean, and we very much look forward to your talk. Okay, thanks, Annelise. Actually, it's Sean Fluker. Fluker. Actually, we should have oh, gone sorry. over the pronunciation first. That's okay. Uh, um, not, not an issue. Um, so thanks for having me, everybody. Uh, I'm very pleased to speak uh, on this topic. It's a topic that um, certainly worked with for, for many, uh, many years in, in a number of capacities, as Annelise has, has described. So I hope um, that this session um, is informative to folks who want to learn a little bit about public participation uh, in energy and environmental issues generally, but also more specifically in relation to dealing with the uh, Alberta energy uh, regulator. So if I can just get you to, to switch to the second slide, okay? A quick overview of what we're going to do <clears throat> this morning. Um, I'm going to say a few words about what public participation is, why it's important in today's society. Uh, really just say a few words about um, the history of public participation in, in Alberta in relation to energy and environmental decision making. Uh, and then um, slowly make my way uh, more specifically to public participation at the Alberta Energy Regulator. So you'll, uh, I'll say a few words more about participation and you know, giving public input into policy making at the government level. And then we'll get more specifically into um, uh, uh, participating in decision making at the Alberta Energy Regulator uh, level. And that will take us into a discussion about these uh, uh, things called statements of, of concern, which is a, a really a key aspect of, of um, participating before the uh, AER, as I'll call it, um, for the rest of the session here. Uh, so uh, on to the next slide, Annelise. Okay, so what do we mean by public participation? Well, I think, and, and hopefully um, most uh, people here this morning um, have a bit of a sense as to what that is. I mean, very generally speaking, we're talking about giving members of the public an opportunity to have a say um, or influence the exercise of public authority or state decision-making power. And so we can be talking, we could be talking about public participation in a wide range of contexts. It doesn't necessarily only arise in the context of, of resource development and environmental issues. I mean, any aspect of public governance has some uh, component of public participation, typically anyways, attached to it. Um, so, but the general parameter stands. And so you know, why is it that we seem to be really focused on 
uh, you know, the adequacy of participatory entitlements these days. Well, one uh, one reason that's not on my screen um, is is really, I think, just sort of the rise of um, social media and the internet generally, and the fact that there's so much information out there that. Uh, you know, I think in some cases that just spurs people to want to have a say or get involved, and that and that that's part of the reason I think why public participation is um, maybe sort of seems more pertinent uh, these days than maybe it did ten or twenty years ago. But um, the truth of the matter is, is that uh, public participation has um, has been an important uh, aspect of public governance for for decades. I mean, it goes back to the 19th century and railway building and the um, you know the, the the conflict or or tensions between an agricultural society and an increasingly industrial society and and the like. So what we're talking about here is not certainly not necessarily sort of a a late only a late 20th century or 21st century issue um, and why it matters the, the the items I have on the screen in terms of democratic deficit social license fairness accuracy of decision making etc those have all been um, you know part of the conversation here for for decades um, but I would I would say that maybe in more recent times, certainly with the rise of um, what we like to call market fundamentalism in in public government, or sort of that neoliberal ideology of um, you know regulatory reduction, or you know what we've been calling more recently in Alberta and and other provinces the sort of idea of red tape reduction. Um, the idea that um, as governments increasingly look at ways to reduce their regulatory uh, scope, um, there still need to be avenues for people to um, have a say, give input into public decisions which they feel affect them or affect um, the public interest. And really the, the question of public participation often does boil back down to this question of who in fact does speak on behalf of the public interest um, and public participation is a significant way in which the populace generally seeks to speak um, not only on their own behalf but also on behalf of the public generally so that's you know uh, an overview of why it matters and this screen also mentions some of the common problems or issues that arise in the context of any process that um, involves public participation. And these questions are very common and can come up, often come up all the time. And that is who gets to participate. So again, while we talk about public participation, that often doesn't mean everybody gets to participate. There's often restrictions uh, imposed. There's gatekeeping involved. Um, if you do get through the gate, uh, you know what kind of participation uh, are you afforded in terms of, you know, for example, do you get to speak directly to a decision maker? Is it indirect through written comments? Do you get to question other participants? Um, do you get to question the decision maker itself? Um, what's the parameters for that discussion? In other words, what exactly do we get to talk about um, or give input on? These are all decisions that have to be made or should be made in the context of any process which seeks to invite public participation. And likewise, um, ensuring that it's meaningful participation often requires us to uh, do something to ensure that participants actually have access to information and knowledge so that they can actually contribute meaningfully and knowledgeably to the decision um, in question. And lastly, um, costs to participate. So in other words, um, that could be a time cost, it's often a monetary cost. Uh, if it's an issue that involves technical matters, um, is there money available for someone to hire uh, expertise to assist them with their participation, whether it's a group or an individual or what have you? Who's going to pay for that? Um, and again, uh, a lot of these issues are amplified by the fact that when we're talking about public participation, um, we're talking about matters that are in the public interest. And so again, 
it's there's a there's certainly a fairness component to that in the sense that it seems somewhat unfair to burden individuals with the obligation to raise public issues and also pay for that pub uh, that participation with their own funds or from their own means. And so, again, that's why funding and costs are often part of the conversation here in terms of who should pay for that. Um, and again, there's, you know, a number of different options available there in terms of, um, you know, does the government provide funding? And you, you certainly do see a little bit of that in the context of uh, environmental impact assessment processes. Um, does the, in the context of a project specific consultation, does the, does the company or the project proponent have to pay for that public engagement? Um, or do the uh, do the participants have to pay for it themselves? And you know, I'm not going to speak much to that here this morning. I don't have time for that. I've I've written a bit about that. Um, I'm happy to field questions on that if if those are things that come up after um, my session here. So um, I'll get you to move to the next slide, Annalise. So just very briefly, um, in terms of Alberta and public participation and resource development, I, I personally believe that public participation or public uh, scrutiny on resource development may have had its beginnings in the Pincher Creek area. And I've got a picture here on the screen of uh, Fred Stenson's excellent book, Who by Fire, which is a um, somewhat non-fictional fictional account of the uh, rise of this of the uh, sour gas uh, industry in uh, in the Pincher Creek area, and again, this just this this conundrum or this idea of you know in a province where the oil and gas industry has led to a lot of uh, wealth and uh, increase in standard of living, why on earth would the citizens of that province ever want to speak out against? Um, the golden goose or look to cook the golden goose if we as we like to say and you know again the 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 the, the negative uh, implications both social and ecological health and otherwise arising particularly i think out of sour gas development uh in my own view really spurred um uh, you know, closer public scrutiny on on resource development and decisions made in that context in the province. And then, I, I think many many folks uh, I suspect here this morning will be familiar with um, uh, the fairly extensive policy consultations done in Alberta in the 1970s concerning the Eastern Slope. So again, if you go back to that 1960s, 1970s era, we see a significant incursion of industrial pressures along the eastern slopes, whether we're talking forestry, water, coal, oil and gas, recreational, etc. And um, the government of the time uh, conducted several um, uh, uh, public engagement consultations on land use along the eastern slopes. And so I've just got a picture here of the 1984 Eastern Slopes policy, land use policy, which actually started in the, as a 1977 version. And again, just that sort of rise of sort of public engagement in resource development, land use policy making. And of course, 1970, early 1970s is also the, the time frame when the coal policy, the infamous um, 1976 coal policy came to be um, uh, came into being as well. So that 1970s era, you know, very highly, um, you know, public, you know, lots of public engagement on broad issues. And that's also when environmental impact assessment uh, as a process really came into being in Canada generally, not just in Alberta. Um, and the last uh, picture on this slide is a is a book written about environmental critical assessment of environmental impact assessment processes. And again, as we moved from the 1980s into the 1990s, um, we saw, particularly in Alberta, and I think in other provinces as well, but it seems to have been very prominent here, a definitive shift away from uh, welcoming the public into some of these decisions, and so again, some folks uh, in the session this morning might be rem might be might remember the uh, controversial LPAC um, pulp mill 
public hearings in the Athabasca region from the late 1980s. And that book here, Winning Back the Words, is in relation to those hearings. And again, I think that's really a threshold point um, from my own research that demonstrates that that's when the Alberta government and Alberta regulators like the AER really started to um, restrict the ability of you know just anybody to participate in um, in their in their proceedings, and so um, I'll get you to move to the next slide, Annalise. So this uh, um, again. So I'm just going to say a few words about public participation in policy making generally before I get to the main event here. So uh, again, I think probably just about everybody here this morning is familiar with the uh, controversy over the. Uh, rescission and then reinstatement of Alberta's 1976 coal policy. And I mean, it's a very explicit example of um, what might happen when uh, governments make significant resource development policy decisions without adequately consulting with the public. And, um, you know, this caused the current government to reverse its take, reinstate the coal policy. And now we are in a phase where uh, Alberta Energy has released terms of reference, again, to go back to that point I was talking about earlier about, you know, what is it that we'll talk about in the context of a public uh, engagement. Um, and we're at that stage now where um, public consultations are um, uh, beginning to be to get to get underway. Um, so, yeah, again, just I think the coal policy is just a good example of uh, the risk governments take when they make major or significant resource development policy decisions without uh, providing a means for public input or public participation or consulting generally with people, particularly on these very large significant issues. Um, like coal mining along the eastern slopes, which has um, you know decades of, of history associated with it. So next slide, please. Um, you know, I, and again, uh, the coal policy is a bad example or an example of bad uh, public consultation. Um, an example of, I think, better public consultation is, of course, the regional land use planning process that the Alberta government has um, been engaged in for more than a decade now. It's certainly stalled, but um, you know, if you go back to 2010, 2012, um, re regional land use planning under the Alberta Land Stewardship Act was all the rage, and Alberta managed to put together the the Lower Athabasca Regional Land Use Plan, which is the uh, area governing the oil sands in the north, and uh, as well in the Lethbridge region, the South Saskatchewan Regional Plan. Um, and these plans uh, are the product of, I would say, extensive public consultation. And I, on the screen here, I just uh, have a, bo a balloon indicating you know, input on regional issues, feedback um, on proposals put forward, uh, and then again on a draft plan, and then the final plan, et cetera. And so I, I guess I would, it's not a perfect process, but I would uh, certainly put forward the regional land use planning process under the Alberta Land Stewardship Act as a as an example of certainly more effective public participation than what we've seen in the uh, in the coal policy. So let's get down to business here with the Alberta land, uh, sorry, the Alberta Energy Regulator. And so again, there's there's generally speaking, there's there's really two levels of public participation at the AER. And so you know, at, at one level is the AR typically invites public comment on uh, new directives or rules or regulations that it proposes to regulate industry with. This tends to be, um, you know, notice to the public and then an opportunity for anyone who's interested to sort of submit written comments or give feedback on the proposal. And on the screen here, I've just got a uh, a picture of a of a blog post uh, that I co-authored earlier this year in relation to part of what the AER is doing in relation to the unfunded oil and gas liabilities problem. And so again, you know, in terms of all of the unreclaimed uh, oil and gas wells, pipelines, facilities, what have you, and again, many of us be familiar with that problem currently in the province. 
Um, the AAR is slowly putting together or reworking its framework for how it's going to regulate industry to ensure that end of life uh, liabilities are are paid for and covered. And so again, some of these rules are starting to come out and 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 the regulator invites public feedback and comment on that. The deficiency with this process is um, rarely, if ever, does the regulator um, provide any response to that uh, feedback. So in other words, I submitted a letter uh, in relation to one of these rules concerning unfunded liabilities. And, you know, I didn't, there's, there's really little acknowledgement of that. And one of the things that more effective engagement would do would be to uh, collect all of the feedback, summarize it in some way, and then indicate to the public how comments were considered and whether they were considered or, or not considered and provide at least a brief explanation for why the regulator either did or did not go a particular direction in relation to comments positive or negative uh, received on these proposals. And that's probably one of the major deficiencies um, at the AAR in terms of its public consultation with um, you know, policy changes is that there's often there's 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 no feedback loop, if you like. Um, and that's certainly something that other regulators uh, uh, do, in fact, do. So um, uh, that would be a critical point uh, that I would raise here in relation to the AR. Nonetheless, um, open to um, to feedback. And next slide, Annalise. The, Getting more specific then to public participation in relation to actual specific applications. So again, I was just talking about you know public uh, participation or, or opportunities to give input into general policies or new directives or the overall approach the regulator is going to take in relation to a particular area, whatever that might be. Um, Usually when we're talking about public participation at the AAR, we're talking about specific projects or applications. And so mostly um, what participants are looking for is some, you know, some hearing or some decision-making uh, forum where um, they uh, get an opportunity to um, oppose something or provide expert evidence in relation to something or just basically question the applicant in relation to some of the assertions they're making about whether something is going to be safe or not safe or, or what have you. Um, and the next slide, Annalise. So, uh, you know, a key aspect of public participation in any decision making process is notice. So in other words, um, you know, it's hard to participate in a decision-making process if you don't know about it. And so notice is really an essential, uh, effective notice is really an essential component of any meaningful public participation. And, you know, uh, when it comes to the Alberta Energy Regulator, um, that generally means keeping your eye on the Alberta Energy Regulator's website. And this particular slide has a reference to um, the specific um, address for these notices. But the AAR will publish notice of applications on its website for 30 days. And so again, the deficiency here is if you're not actively following that page, um, you're not actually going to get notice of applications. Now, that is really meant, uh, uh, I'm saying that in relation to public participation, you know, a landowner who um, uh, faces the prospect of an oil and gas application facility on their land is obviously going to know about it because the company is going to have approached them um, well in advance of even making the application. But for public participation generally in relation to applications, um, the public actually uh, has to keep its eye on on this on this website because the public itself is not going to get notice any other way. So next uh, slide, please. And if you go onto that website, you'll see that notices get issued every day, just about. And on this slide, it's just an, an example of what one of these notices looks like. And so I've just, you know, it typically has, you know, what the application is about, who's making the application, um, where you can get more information about the application, the project in question. 
and how you participate. Um, next slide, please. So let's get specifically into how you would participate in a specific project decision. And so really the starting point for a member of the public is to file what the AER calls a statement of concern. And there's a specific process for how you do that, um, which I will uh, provide in a minute. But the statement of concern process um, is the starting point. And so if you do not file a statement of concern, it is almost a certainty that you will not have any opportunity to give any input in relation to an application. So again, the notice is important because it triggers the 30 day requirement to file a statement of concern. And then step two is file the statement of concern. And so the next slide, if you will, Annalise, is really just a screenshot of a form that you can find on the Alberta Energy Regulators website that gives that you can fill out in terms of providing a statement of concern. I mean, the essential here is basically who are you, what's your concern with the application, and what do you want the regulator to do about it? Um, that's the basic es essence of what you're asked to provide. Uh, next slide, please. The key with public participation in specific project decision making at the AR is this it's this question of uh, are you directly and adversely affected and this again is is a test for participation or standing as we call it in legal circles which is you know common across um, uh, very re various regulatory frameworks but in relation to the Alberta energy regulator a person who files a statement of concern has to demonstrate that they may be directly and adversely affected by that project. And that's a, typically construed in a very narrow way. So in other words, um, a member of the public who cannot demonstrate any sort of you know, personal impact on them in relation to a specific application is frankly going to have a very difficult time meeting this, meeting this test. And this is uh, one of the reasons why the AER actually doesn't hold very many public hearings anymore in relation to um, resource project decisions. And so I'll just get you to go to the next slide, Annalise, as we're moving along quickly here. Again, the AER has a website, a web, sorry, a web page on its site that lists all of its statement of concern decisions. And I've got on the screen here a, um, a screenshot from yesterday. They come up just about every day. And the majority of these statements of concern, next slide, please. Uh, the AR will respond to a statement of concern filer indicating, look, we received your statement of concern. Um, here's our response to it. And, and again, these letters are now published on the website, which is uh, certainly an improvement from years past. What I've got on the screen here is a redacted version of, of a, to take out uh, specific names, although this is on the website, so you could certainly see all this. These are public documents. Um, but anyways, this is an example of one where the regulator has said, thank you for filing your statement of concern. Um, you know, we're not going to hold a hearing in this context because typically, you know, we don't feel your concerns are within our authority to address or we feel like your concerns have been adequately addressed by the company um, or sometimes again you can't you haven't demonstrated how this particular project affects you personally in other words you haven't met the directly and adversely affected test and these are by and large overwhelming majority the response the regulator gives to persons who file statements of concern so i'll just go to the next slide Annalise. So yeah, just quickly to wrap up here, because I've only got about a minute left, the, the bottom line on public participation at the AR is, is really these points, right? There, no, one, no member of the public has a right to participate. I mean, you can be invited to participate, but that comes at the discretion of the regulator. Um, absolutely must file a statement of concern with the regulator if you want any opportunity to participate but again whether the regulator accepts that statement of concern and and takes your feedback into account depends on the regulator making a number of favorable determinations which i've listed here on the screen for you and i've uh, talked about briefly the end result of that is that most landowners facing applications on their land um, can certainly demonstrate they're directly and adversely affected by a project, but they can rarely demonstrate that their concerns haven't been addressed by the company. 
Um, and part of that is an information problem. I mean, again, what, what, what you're, the information that you're left to work with as a, as a statement of concern filer um, can actually be very deficient, which I think makes it difficult for people sometimes to, um, to, to ac ac accurately state their case uh, for a hearing or some other form of participatory entitlement. And as you can see here on the screen, the chart here, which is from the AER website, the AER holds very, very few actual hearings in relation to energy project applications these days. And the reason why is because it's very difficult to get through the gate of public participation. So I think I've used up all my time. It's amazing how fast this goes, but uh, I'm happy to take any questions that, that people have. Um, and I think we have a, a good 30 minutes for that. And the, the last slide on my PowerPoint is just some additional reading. I'll just uh, leave that last slide up for a minute so people can have a minute to um, to take note of that while I ask the first question. And our first question comes from Trevor Page. According to the AER, there are about 170,000 abandoned oil and gas wells in Alberta. Which government department is responsible for, for ensuring that companies clean them up. Yeah, so the the unfunded end of life liability problem is probably one of Alberta's most pressing and difficult public policy issues uh, going forward. Um, the obligation to um, to clean up uh, unreclaimed oil and gas wells in the province rests on the companies that drilled the wells and everybody here is familiar with the fact that um, in many instances those companies are long gone left the province or there's a new owner and the owner doesn't have money for it or what have you and the deficiency is that to put it bluntly um, again Alberta the government of Alberta in the late 1980s and early 1990s made a policy decision not to require companies to post security or bonds to pay for that cleanup. And so they've always sort of just um, uh, allowed that liability to be kicked down the road, if you like, uh, until there's nobody left uh, to pay for it. And so that's why we've seen um, primarily federal uh, money uh, find its way into Alberta. And, and Al the Alberta Energy Regulator is um, in connection with the Department of, of of energy, Alberta Energy, is overseeing and managing the the uh, this distribution and spending of that taxpayer money uh, to have oil and gas wells um, reclaimed. And so, to answer the question specifically, uh, the obligation rests with the holder of the light, current holder of the license. The law allows the government to go back in time, in some cases, to to track down previous licensees. The pragmatic reality is, is that it's going to be the current licensee or, or nobody um, who cleans it up. And that's a very unsatisfactory answer, but that's the reality. And, and, and that's a reality because again, uh, in, the, in the late 1980s and early 1990s, this was a problem that um, uh, the Alberta government knew about and they chose to kick the can down the road and, and um, and we're paying for it now. Our next question comes from Danny Fieldberg, although I think it's more a comment than a question. I'll read it out anyway. Um, these contracts are being issued now. One of the limiting factors in the speed of cleanup is the lack of class two industrial landfills to take the hydrocarbon contaminated soil during cleanup. Yeah, I don't doubt that's the case. Um, and in fact, uh, again, uh, Al Alberta uh, has a very, I would say, immature and inadequate regulatory framework for handing, handling the disposal of oil and gas waste. Um, it's amazing when you dig into, it's amazing when you dig into um, the, the regulatory framework for the oil, you know, the full life cycle of the oil and gas industry. Um, most of the attention has always been paid on the sort of upstream drilling and development. Um, and what we're seeing now is sort of the, 
the the sort of end of life side of this has largely been ignored by policymakers. Ignore is maybe a strong word, but um, certainly hasn't been given the attention that that it ought to have um, ought to have been given. And this is going to be an issue um, in this province for 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 years to come. And I certainly hope it's an election issue um, in uh, in the elections to follow as well. Our next question comes from Knut Peterson. Regarding coal, coal mining in the eastern slopes, anyone downstream can arguably be considered directly affected. Your thoughts, please. Uh, yes, that's, that's certainly the position that, um, uh, that many uh, individuals take, and you know, I've advocated for, my, for it myself. Um, the term directly affected, though, has been interpreted certainly by regulatory agencies in this province and also by Alberta courts generally as much more limited than that. And so in other words, um, typically speaking, um, the, the, the test has required people to establish that somehow they're more personally impacted by something as opposed to just, um, you know, being a, a down, being a downstream uh, or, or residing or working uh, or recreating downstream from a coal mine, you typically have to establish that there's some personal impact, and and many people can establish that, but um, many people have have difficulty uh, with that. And and again, it's it's a it's a test that is um, largely based on the evidence that can be put forward, and it can often be a difficult barrier to 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 overcome. Um, and and so. Uh, I'd, I'd like to say that that, uh, that restriction is slowly being uh, uh, eroded away a little bit. I've certainly been involved in some of that litigation recently to try to, to, try to do that. Um, um, but but it, it, it certainly can, can be a challenge. And I think anybody that seeks to participate in energy uh, or environmental decision-making, I mean, just has to be aware that at some point in the process, if... You know, you don't live next to a particular project. Somebody's going to ask you to establish how you're directly uh, affected by it. In, in Alberta, it's it certainly a certainty you'll be asked that question. Um, whether you can establish that you're directly affected to their satisfaction um, is uh, unfortunately a, a little bit harder to predict in the abstract. Our next question comes from um, Mark Goodall. Um, does the AR ever refer to others for expert opinion regarding assessment of an application, for instance, to question a company's environmental assessment? Yeah, so again, that's a great question. I mean, one of the things that is problematic, I think, is that, and again, if you go back to, um, you don't have to go back to that slide, but I noted at, towards the end of my own uh, talk here that the AER holds very few hearings anymore on project applications. And what that means is that those sorts of questions, like questioning the applicant, the company on its own proposal, um, often those questions um, are asked behind closed doors, or certainly the, those questions are not, um, that dialogue is not made public. And so the public generally is um, really not privy to some of those conversations. So I don't doubt for a second that the Alberta Energy Regulator uh, will bring in its own expertise from time to time and ask those questions of of project proponents, but I think the problem is uh, we can't know for sure that they've actually asked those questions, um, and uh, there's very little or no public scrutiny on on the adequacy of the response to those questions. So, um, you know, uh, absolutely, an environmental impact assessment. Uh, I'll just use this moment to rant for a second. I mean, Alberta, in, environmental impact assessment in Alberta generally, not just in energy projects, but really across the gamut of all the projects that are regulated by Alberta environment, is extremely closed process. There's almost no, I mean, we talk about the Alberta energy regulator being 
more or less closed to public input. But um, ironically, it's more open than um, than Alberta Environment is in in a lot of the projects that Alberta Environment um, regulates. So again, one of the issues that arose um, a year or two ago that, and this is related to the question, so I'll get to it. But in relation to environmental impact assessment, there was the controversy in Kananaskis country a couple of years ago over um, the uh, uh, taking of, of water by Fortress Mountain for water bottling in Calgary. And uh, again, there was no public environmental impact assessment process done. Alberta environment officials certainly questioned the project proponent in relation to some environmental and wildlife impacts. But all of that disclosure came out largely because of access to information requests by various individuals and groups. So none of it was freely made available. It was never published on the Alberta Environment website. And so, um, so that's a great question. And I think it's, uh, I, 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 thanks for asking it because it, it really, I think it actually demonstrates the point that I actually think public um, participation and disclosure might even be worse at the Alberta environment level. For as bad as the AER is, um, they have a fairly robust website with a lot of information on it. And it's a uh, light years better than what Alberta environment provides. Um, our next question comes from Beth Mundell. With hearings dependent on individual impact, public good is removed from the issue. How can this be changed? Yeah, that is a, and that's a long-standing problem with a, with a regulatory approach that focuses in on the application or the specific project. And so I guess, um, Part of the way in which I tried to address that this morning was just to demonstrate that um, it is possible and there are public consultations undertaken at the more general land use planning level or the policy level. Um, the, the shortcoming there, though, is that those are often just notice and comment processes where, again, a proposed land use approach is put on the table like we're seeing with the coal policy for example and you know the government invites written comments um, and there isn't an opportunity to uh, question industry or government officials um, or you know it's not a, a true public inquiry in the in the in the full sense of the word and so it often leaves participants um, less than satisfied. And so it, it is uh, for sure a characteristic of energy and environmental uh, decision-making in Alberta that most, the best opportunity to raise those, those um, public interest issues is on the back of an individual project, um, which often only gets to a hearing because an individual landowner or other person who can meet that directly affected test gets the gets the thing um, to a hearing, and so um, uh, uh, there's countless examples of that. And um, the, the the one the more the most recent one that I'm familiar with, for example, is and it's it's relevant to the to the sort of southern Alberta area is that the Alberta Energy Regulator just last month announced that it's going to hold a hearing in relation to the proposed transfer of licenses from Shell Canada to Paraday Energy in relation to uh, its uh, foothills sour gas assets, um, both in Pincher, west of Calgary, and in the Caroline region. And that hearing is going to be, to, to go to Bev's question, that hearing is going to be specific to the application by Shell to transfer those assets to Parity Energy. But the underlying reason for the hearing, if you were to look at all the statements of concern that were filed in relation to that application, is that broader public interest question, which uh, was raised by somebody else earlier, which is this question of unfunded liabilities in the oil and gas sector. So the, the public issue in that hearing is going to be, will there be enough money uh, available to, to re fully reclaim 
these assets, including these very old gas plants, um, when the time comes to do that? And should we let Shell transfer these assets without leaving that money behind, basically? And so that's very much a public governance question because it speaks directly to the the, the broader um, the, the the broader public policy issue, which the AER and Alberta Energy are working on at, at, as well, which is this question of sort of revamping the whole approach to unfunded end of life oil and gas liabilities. So, you know, my hope is that that hearing that that shell hearing, which um, there hasn't been a notice of hearing issued yet, but the regulator has indicated there's going to be a hearing. My hope is that that hearing is 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 robust enough that um, it allows for that. And sometimes these hearings can do that. Um, but I, I agree uh, fully that often these individual project hearings, um, the, the reason for them you know, if you like, the elephant in the room is a broader public issue question that there's just nowhere else to raise it. And I mean, that goes back, I think, to uh, one of the things I pointed out early in my slides, which is, you know, the interest in public participation these days is really uh, a democratic deficit in the sense that there are there are just there are no other available forums to knowledgeably raise um, these questions. And so. Um, it's a conundrum that uh, remains to be resolved. Our next question comes from Laurie Schultz. Can you discuss the implications of the lack of ability to participate in or submit one's concerns to the AR, AER or to any regulatory body on democracy as a whole and what actions can be taken? Yeah, so I mean, and again, I like, and there's lots of examples of this, but I, I like to demonstrate or use the coal policy rescission as an example of what happens when adequate opportunities are not provided for, for public input. And so again, uh, uh, I think it often leads to um, either civil or uncivil disobedience. Um, again, just maybe to look to the West, to our... Um, province to the west of us. There's certainly been in the news recently um, the uh, the protests and the arrests made in relation to the Ferry Creek logging on Vancouver Island. And again, that's a direct result of decisions being made in relation to resource disposition where um, opportunities were not given for uh, adequate uh, public consultation and engagement, at least, you know, at the outset. I think it often leads to civil disobedience um, and and protests. And in the context of, of governments, it often it becomes an uncomfortable situation as as we saw with the coal policy, where the government has to back down or or reverse its decision. I mean, it's, politically, it's very embarrassing. Um, and so I think in, in, to a large extent, it comes back to this idea of, well, the idea of the social license to operate is not, you know, legally entrenched in Canada. Um, it is it is very much um, influential in the sense that, you know, the industry, for example, if we stick to the coal policy for a minute, those those multinational coal companies um, uh, I'm certain they're pressing, they were behind pressing the government to, well, obviously to rescind the policy, but also to reinstate it at the end of the day when they realized that um, there would be a groundswell of public opposition to um, to their proposals. And frankly, it's not in their interest either. So uh, for, for that to happen. And so um, failure to engage adequately or meaningfully with the public can lead, I think, to um, these sort of outcomes where, uh, you know, industry doesn't get what it wants, the government suffers political points as a result of that. Um, and, and, and so, you know, to, to me, that's a, a strong reason for doing something in relation to public engagement. Now, that leads to the next question, though, which is to say, um, it's one thing to say you're going to engage with the public. It's quite another to say how you're going to do it and what that's going to consist of. 
And, uh, you know, we're in the early days of the coal policy consultation in that regard, but quite often um, what, what well, ultimately ends up being offered to the public um, is far less than what people um, what people want. And, and whether there's a, a resolution to that at the, at the regulatory level, I'm not so sure. Um, I think ultimately uh, some of that has to end up in broader political processes. And, um, you know, I, 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 I think that um, uh, it certainly, I'm surprised it hasn't happened yet, but I think sooner rather than later, um, we, we need um, at the political level a push to, to drastically reform how Alberta approaches public participation in resources and environmental decision making. Again, if you go back to my brief overview of the history earlier this morning, a lot of decisions were made uh, behind closed doors and in a secretive fashion to slowly sort of close opportunities for public um, participation in these in these matters. And so the, the, the regulatory framework that we currently work under reflects those decisions even today. It's been that way for the better part of 20 or 30 years. And there's only so much that can be gained by litigating these issues on a case-by-case basis. And I've done some of that, so I can tell you it's a very slow process. And even when you win or make gains, um, it's 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 not nearly as effective as you know a, a much sort of broader policy or law reform initiative. But um, you know we need. Uh, we need we need a government that's willing to do that, and um, and people in that government that bring that to the table. Um, and Alberta has had, you know, unfortunately, few. Uh, no doubt, it's it's uh, um, one of the negative side effects of of having the same party govern you for the better part of half a century. Um, our next question comes from Knut Peterson. Alberta politicians like to say we have a world-class regulations without effecting enforcement, however. That seems like a hollow statement. Yeah, well, I mean, again, I, I think that um, I, would, I, would, I wouldn't disagree with that. Um, uh, unfortunately, I, I think sometimes, um, you know, certainly at the at the at the politician level, um, you know, it's just too easy to make statements like that without having to get into the sort of details of things. And so, I mean, I, I, you know, environmental enforcement or enforcement at the at the uh, regulatory level, the the AER, for example, um, certainly has a compliance and enforcement process in relation to uh, regulating the, the energy industry. Um, it would be constrained by, you know, the number of people that it budgets to, to, um, to do that work um, and, you know, uh, and things like that. But, but it, certainly there is an, an, a compliance and enforcement process in the province for sure. Um, you know, whether it's effective or not, is uh, certainly open to debate, and um, you know whether it's world class um, is uh, is also open uh, open open to debate. Um, but but uh, but there is one um, for sure. There you know there is one. So uh, but again, uh, politicians uh, I think like to make statements like that. Um, uh, but, uh, you know, I, I think, unfortunately, you need to dig into the detail a little bit before you decide uh, whether that's really the, really the case or not. I don't know if I answered your question, but yeah. Um, Danny Fieldberg has another comment, which I'll read out. The 70s was when landowners began to fight back on energy development in, the Eastern Al- in Eastern Alberta. This led to the formation of the Service Rights Board. Yeah, so the, again, it's the late 60s and into the 1970s was a very formative period, I think, for just sort of uh, increased public scrutiny and engagement on these kinds of issues. And, you know, again, you can just keeping focus on, on the Alberta Energy Regulator or its predecessor, the Energy Resources Conservation Board. I mean, there were um, 
that there were relatively speaking a lot of very public hearings on um, you know even individual well applications so again thinking down in the Pincher Creek area there were a number of ERCB hearings uh, in relation to some of Shell's um, you know deep sour gas wells back then that were proposed on public land those hearings wouldn't happen today i don't think i mean they were they were long hearings you know several weeks at a time and um i agree i mean it it, it reflects the time frame and it reflects the period and then there was a there was a shift that happened in the late 1980s particularly in alberta but i think in other jurisdictions as well where, where government officials decided um, probably at the request of industry to uh, to tighten the lid on 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 public hearings and um, and you certainly saw that happen um, uh, certainly at the at the e, at the AER level absolutely over the course of the 1990s the number of hearings it held uh, re was reduced drastically and it used the standing test directly and adversely affected to um, uh, to, to do that and then you know, Federally, uh, environmental impact assessment uh, certainly still had more of an open door policy. It always had, but you'll re some people on the call here will, re will remember that the federal conservatives in 2012 um, made a you know completely revamped federal environmental impact assessment. And one of the things they tried to do was introduce that sort of directly affected test to participate in federal environmental impact assessment. Um, they didn't have much success with that, and the current federal government campaigned on reversing that decision in 2015, and I, you know, in and and followed through with that with the Impact Assessment Act. And again, here we are again, fighting over that. Um, so sometimes this all feels like a never-ending circle. Knut Peterson, if you are familiar with the Jessica Ernst story, can you please comment? on the long drawn out legal battle going all the way to the Supreme Court of Canada in the context of the AER? Well, um, so that's not really tied directly to public participation per se. I mean, uh, Jessica and the regulator um, have, have had a long standing dispute over how the regulator um, regulates uh, you know, oil and gas activity on and in and around her her lands uh, in the in the rose in the rosebud area. And that litigation that went to the Supreme Court of Canada ultimately was focused on um, uh, Jessica's uh, seeking to actually uh, sue the regulator uh, for um, uh, for damages and whether or not the regulator is immune to that or not. And so that's an, ex I mean, to go back to somebody's question from um, a little while ago, that's another implication, I think, of what happens when a regulatory agency decides to come down very restrictively on either an individual or group of individual. I mean, I mentioned earlier that it leads to civil and uncivil disobedience. It also leads to some very nasty litigation. Um, and again, I, I could we could probably look at Jessica's um, uh, what Jessica has gone through as an example of what happens when really the regulator, um, uh, you know, it becomes a very adversarial relationship. And that litigation that went to the Supreme Court of Canada was all about her ability to sue the regulator for 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 negligence, um, for for damages, for liability. Um, I'm not familiar with um, with currently where that's at. I know she was also seeking damages from Alberta Environment, uh, sort of in relation to the same in relation to the same issues. But the Supreme Court decided that the AER had statutory immunity from uh, from that from that liability, and that uh, that's I think that more or less ended um, her attempts in that regard. Vis-a-vis -vis the AER, anyway. Yeah. So. Um, Trevor Page. Legally, is the AER required to report to any Alberta government entity? Well, the AER is directly accountable to the Minister of Energy. So the accountability link there is going to be to the minister. 
um, and you know, it, via the minister to to cabinet uh, to cabinet generally. Um, but no, the uh, if I understand the question correctly, I mean the, the AR does not necessarily have reporting obligations to all uh, aspects of government, and the reporting obligations it has will be those that are imposed on it by its governing legislation. So, I mean, it, it will have reporting obligations in relation to, uh, you know, certain aspects of its regulatory functions, um, but it's directly report accountable to the Minister of Energy, for sure. I'm uh, very aware of the time. We're right on 11 o'clock. We have two more questions in the queue. Um, what is your time like, Sean? Are you able to quickly answer those questions or can we, or are, are you on a time constraint and should we wrap up? Oh, no, no, you ask the questions, no problem, okay. for sure. Yeah. yeah. Laurie Schultz, what are your thoughts regarding younger generations? Will, there, will they have the momentum or effect to change ineffective regulatory processes. Shall I read that again? I think I... What are the thoughts regarding younger generations? Will they have the momentum or effect to change ineffective regulatory processes, etc.? What What are your thoughts? <laughs> well, we're getting outside of my expertise for sure. Um, but, but, you know, my for what it's worth, my thoughts are... Um, you know, again, I think the younger generation is very adept and um, savvy at using things like social media. I mean, there's lots of examples of, of that where, you know, some well-timed uh, social media posts, whether it's on Instagram, Twitter, what have you, uh, spur or lead to a broader, um, uh, you know, movement or, or, or you know, public position on a, on a particular issue. I mean, we saw that, I think, even just recently here. Southern Alberta in relation to the Kananaskis Conservation Pass, for example, with, um, and I wrote about it recently on ablog.ca, where uh, somebody noted that the, the off-highway vehicle area of Kananaskis was excluded from the pass. I mean, those are, that's a great way to engage the public. Um, the downside to that, I think, and this is where I'm really outside of my element here, so take this with a grain of salt, but the downside to that element might be that, um, the effectiveness of those mechanisms uh, dissuades or, you know, it doesn't, um, uh, people don't follow through with that and, and, can, and continue into, you know, more traditional forms of political action, because ultimately, uh, some of that has to find its way into, you know, people being willing to uh, enter the political realm to make changes and run for office, for example, and what have you. So I know there's a lot of studies being done on the extent to which the extensive use of social media and other uh, forums by younger generations is going to have an impact there. Um, and I'm really not <clears throat> in a position to comment on that other than to note that I'm, I'm familiar with that. But, uh, um, but yeah, so far. Okay. Our last question comes from Beth Mundell. How would a good regula regulator look? Would it be government funded? How would the current situation be avoided? Any good regulators come to mind? Yeah, good question, Bev. So, I mean, you know, what, yeah, for sure. One of the things that's in the back of the room with the Alberta Energy Regulator is, is that it is funded largely by industry. And so, again, um, that's a constraint, right? I mean, uh, basically, if you're looking for true, um, let's just use the word independent regulatory functions, um, uh, there's no better way that we know of than to fund um, that institution with public money and make it accountable to the public um, and so you know that's certainly a, um, a disturbing trend I think generally in in regulation um, other agencies that come to mind for me that actually still have industry funding but you know seem to um, uh, you know, I think anyways, uh, come across uh, in a much different light to me would be like the Alberta Securities Commission, for example, which regulates uh, the capital markets. Um, 
you know, they and and collaborates with the commissions across the country, for example. Um, uh, you know, a similar agency to the Alberta Energy Regulator and the type of institution that it is, but um, I think a very different approach to issues like public participation. That's what I had in mind when I mentioned a while ago about, you know, public comment processes and requiring agencies to not only take in comments from the public, but but actually uh, describe how those comments were considered, um, you know, whether they were considered or not and how. Um, you see a lot more of that in the capital markets regulation um, than you do uh, in energy and um, environmental regulation. So, um, so yeah, and, and, you know, the AER, you know, for, um, uh, for, all, of its, uh, for all of its faults, um, you know, is at least a regulatory institution uh, with a with a public face to it. I mean, compare that to uh, resource uh, disposition decisions made in areas like forestry, for example, where most of that decision making is really just done uh, at the ministerial level, um, or all the different decisions that are made by Alberta Environment, for example, in relation to endangered species or water or wetlands or things like that they're far less un unbelievably they're even more less transparent than than the AER is so um, for all the things I would do to improve uh, how the Alberta energy regulator uh, performs its functions um, I uh, I have to say that um, there's probably more room for improvement in um, areas governed by uh, departments like Alberta Environment, for example, or Alberta Forestry, where a lot of the decisions are really completely non-transparent. I mean, anybody here who's, you know, taken the time to, you know, look at even just the websites for Alberta Forestry, Alberta Environment would certainly have to agree with me that they're um, very non-user friendly and really provide um uh, very little useful information in relation to informing the public on decisions that are made, whether it's in relation to issuing forest management agreements for forestry companies or, um, you know, uh, decisions made in relation to, you know, the filling of wetlands, for example, by Alberta Environment and, the, you know, any environmental impact assessment really in relation to a project that doesn't happen to be an energy project. Um, so, yeah, lots of work to do there. And, you know, I guess, um, uh, yeah, maybe one of these days I'll have to, you know, think about running for office or something to sort of uh, make some of these changes. I, they, they really do. It, 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 needs, it needs an overhaul at the uh, policy and, and legislative, um, legislative level for sure. And it's a, it's a problem that's, you know, 20 or 30 years in the making in this province. So, um, yeah. Okay, well, thank you very much for your time today with us here at SACPA, Sean. And um, before we finish this session, do you have a take home message for our viewers? Uh, well, I think I sort of just gave it there um, a second ago, which is that, you know, it's a it's a huge issue and it and and um, yeah, it requires significant legislative and, and policy reform to sort I think to get you know, meaningful public participation uh, at, you know, various aspects of um, uh, energy and environmental decision making. In Alberta, there's a number of layers to it. It can be, unfortunately, very confusing uh, to, to, to folks who don't follow it regularly, whether you're talking federal environmental impact assessment or provincial environmental impact assessment. The the approach to public participation varies significantly between sectors, whether it's forestry or oil and gas or, um, you know, recreation. And so, yeah, it's a, it's a difficult area to stay on top of. And the Alberta Energy Regulator, like I said, for all of its faults, I mean, at least there's a, uh, there's a, you know, a fairly detailed website there. It's pretty clear what the regulator is supposed to regulate, even if you don't agree that they do a very good job of it. Um, and increasingly, I think the policy issues are um, becoming, you know, uh, yeah, you know, more 
more um, more focused in the sense of, you know, again, I think it's very clear in Alberta, we're looking at a, a number of years of, you know, dealing with the end of life liabilities issue in the oil and gas sector and, and things like that. So, um, but yeah, there's, there's certainly lots, uh, lots of work to be done. Thanks. Thanks for having me. Yeah. Thank you. And for our viewers, I hope you join us next week. We have Najib uh, Mango, Immigration Matters, Why Canada Supports Immigration. So that is next Thursday at our same time at 10 a.m. And I hope you join us then. And thank you again, Sean.